So what I wanted to want to focus on mostly can today. Can I just point out real quick before we start? That I think there's a kind of a cruel irony in the organization of this session, and that it is true that one of the people on stage here has 20 years of experience building company cultures. But uh, I think the directionality of the interview might be. <laughs> you could turn, at least you could turn it around. Describe new mistakes. Uh, we'll talk about AI, which you know much more <laughs> about than I do. Um, so. What I wanted to focus on, because it would be most relevant to the, mo the greatest set of the audience, is both recruiting and uh, culture. Um, and there's obviously a relationship between those two things. Stripe's been amazing at creating and forging a reputation among developers and technical talent as the go-to place in Silicon Valley, particularly among startups. What I really wanted to ask is, how did you start, how did you build that at first? Now that you have a reputation and a brand and a lot of traction, it's a lot easier, but how did you do it when nobody knew who you were? Um, so, so I, at the time, I guess we sort of hadn't figured out that there was necessarily a particularly good strategy to accomplish the whole thing, although I guess in hindsight, I think there were a few things where sort of uh, we lucked out. Um, I think the, the first one, and this is something that uh, I think has maybe become a little bit clearer over the last couple of years as we've uh, sort of come to see a bunch of companies be successful at it, uh, and that uh, it, it's in some ways easier to build a really good team if you're uh, solving a hard problem than an easy problem. And I think even more broadly, uh, there's almost a way in which it, it's just easier full stop to solve a hard problem than an easy one. And so at the time, like when we were starting Stripe in early 2010, it was the era of sort of social games and uh, there was kind of a, a bunch of semi-ephemeral or at least uh, ostensibly kind of lightweight business models kind of percolating around the valley, right? And so we were pitching people on this like infrastructure, it was going to be hard, there were legal problems, there were going to be international expansion problems, all these things, right? And I think for sort of the best people, that's actually kind of more attractive, the idea of building something really durable uh, than the proverbial next recipe app, right? Um, and so I think that certainly helped out a lot. The bigger one, I think, actually, was uh, we... Uh, we, we actually sort of started Stripe gradually. We were in school and we started working on it and we weren't sure if we wanted to work on it full time or not. Um, and, uh, and, and we knew that even once we did start working on it full time, it was going to take us quite a while before we could launch it publicly. And so that effectively pushed out our time horizon in terms of recruiting. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's kind of the great Jeff Bezos quote about how you can just use time horizons as a competitive advantage. In that if you are operating on a five year, seven year time horizon and your competitors are operating quarter to quarter, there's sort of a set of strategies that are open to you that aren't open to them. I think there's a variant of that that was kind of, again, not necessarily consciously at the time, but in hindsight, kind of. Uh, open to us, where because we knew there was going to be, say, almost two years before we'd launch, we, we were sort of hiring on a two-year time horizon, and everyone else was hiring for like almost literally next quarter, right? Um, and so it took us uh, almost two years uh, to recruit our first seven people, right? And so in terms of like people per month, that's sort of a, a, an atrocious record. Actually, if you, if you, you know, discount myself and John, there's actually five people in almost two years. And we talked to a ton of people and we sort of maybe started working with some a little bit and, and then sort of figured that it wasn't quite the right fit and so forth. Um, such as that, I think, really made a, a, a huge difference. Um, uh, and then I guess maybe thirdly, uh, I, I think, People try this in various ways and so forth, but uh, I think that it's kind of critically important, uh, or at least extremely valuable, if if you can sort of thread the needle to just work with people uh, before definitively deciding one way or the other. And so there's like all these IP issues and sort of potential pitfalls. I think if you if you kind of go about things that way, we decided to just kind of run the risk. And so there were a bunch of people that we sort of did a trial week with or a trial couple couple weeks, things like this, right? And I ended up deciding not to work with them, and we had to sort of, you know, again, be careful on the paperwork side of things there, but it enabled us to, to not make, uh, 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 you know, bad hires we might uh, otherwise have. Um, a, a few other ideas, but I'll pause there for a moment. Yeah, so one of the things you generally advise people is to really obsess on your first 10 hires because each of them is going to replicate themselves 10 times. So what was the criteria you were thinking in the back of your mind when you met those people and they were looking for one of those top 10, uh, first 10 positions? Right. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess the kind of all the, the standard things, obviously you want someone who's you know, extremely smart and pleasant to work with and, and, and whatever else. Uh, I think the things we sort of particularly over-indexed on were um, uh, 
you, for, the, for the first 10 people, I think you want people who sort of will hit the ground running and already know what they're going to do. Uh, in that, I think it's right to sort of uh, uh, take bets on, on sort of inexperienced talent and have them develop with a company and things like that, right? But I, uh, at least from our perspective, for the first 10 people, we sort of knew what we wanted to build and uh, we, we did not have time in the first couple of months to, to, to be training them, basically. Um, the, the, the sort of the, uh, well, one way in which I think it's kind of helpful to think about startups is you want to be sort of making decisions uh, on, a, on a time horizon roughly equal to kind of the, the longevity of the company, right? Uh, and so kind of after three years, you can afford to think on a three-year time horizon. But after six months, you, you sort of don't get to look that much more than kind of six months ahead, right? And so maybe nine months into this company, we're thinking, how can we maximize the productivity for the next nine months? And so they had to be people who are sufficiently experienced that they could be sort of really productive uh, uh, in that period. Um, a, a somewhat personal one, but I think now there were sort of uh, 250 people, one that's kind of uh, paid a lot of dividends, is you know, lots of companies have the proverbial no asshole rule. I think you know, obviously that, that, that's a good thing to do. W but we tried to hire people who are sort of like particularly nice uh, and, and just generally happy um, in that, uh, you know, uh, if you're sort of to describe the characteristics you wanted your company to have, right? Uh, you, you, one of the adjectives you'd probably ascribe to the culture, uh, well, at least personally speaking, is happy, right? But it would seem sort of, uh, it, it seems almost like a, a tough startup in itself to figure out how to sort of create a culture that like ingests unhappy people and magically makes them happy, right? And, you know, if we succeed at that, we, we, we're probably something even more valuable. Um, and so instead of sort of trying to figure out how to solve that at the culture level, we just tried to hire people who are intrinsically happy already and kind of cheat uh, uh, in terms of getting to the answer. Uh, so we really sought uh, that out. Um, and then, and then I guess thirdly, uh, it wasn't sort of merely enough for people to be good, but they had to be sort of known to be good uh, uh, by others. And this kind of comes back to the, the 10x point in that if you sort of, uh, in hiring the first 10 people, if you sort of visualize your, your company at 100 people, um, like by and large, those residual 90 people uh, are going to, to, to a kind of uh, a disconcerting degree, the, the, the subsequent 90 are going to be determined by those, say, other eight people you hire. Um, and so uh, you, you, you don't just want them to be good, you want them to be known to be good such that they're going to attract you know, a, a bunch of other super talented individuals uh, alongside them. And you know, that really played out, and kind of, again comes to the time horizon thing. There are multiple people at Stripe, like somewhere between maybe 12 and 24, um, who, took, uh, who took us in each case, years to recruit. Uh, there are multiple people at Stripe who took us l literally now more than four years to recruit. Um, and when you're starting out, sort of, it seems almost, almost useless to sort of be investing in things that might or might not pay dividends, uh, uh, sort of. Um, on that time horizon, but the way we kind of rationalized it was that, well, we're already sort of, um, uh, <laughs> we, we already have sort of taken the bet that we're going to succeed. If we don't succeed, you know, nothing matters. So we might as well assume that we are, in which case recruiting people on a multi-year time horizon is important and kind of worked out. So let me double click on a couple of those points. So first of all, you actually explicitly allow any employee to veto a new hire? Uh, that is true. Um, w well, uh, inevitably, it's sort of you have to circumscribe it a little bit as you get larger, just because not everyone is involved in every hire. Um, but uh, but in the beginning, uh, obviously, w way more costly to make a bad hire uh, than to uh, the, the, to pass on a good one, and so vetoes are really important. Uh, we also sort of tried to give people as much opportunity kind of as possible to spot a characteristic that they might want to veto. And so this kind of comes back to the you work with them for a week beforehand or something like this. I think that, I think that this is the case for literally all of our first um, maybe 12 or 13 people, we, we worked with them for at least a week uh, before we made them an offer. And so people had, I mean, they had lunches, dinners, everything with them. And in, in many cases, we had them stay with us uh, for the first week. Uh, that's you know, not, not, not always an option, but we, we really tried to sort of assemble as much data as possible such that folks could, could spot anything they didn't like. And then about 20% of your company founded a company previously? Yes, uh, actually, I think it was almost all of the first 10 people um, had started companies. Um, I, I, I think, yes, every one of the first 10. Um, and this kind of comes back to the kind of being known and hitting the ground running. Um, uh, we ha had sort of a sense for the, the um, like, 
what we wanted to build on a one to two year time horizon, and the question was just how can we do that most you know, expediently? And if we were sort of trying to task manage people or sort of just track the whole thing, I mean, we were not experienced managers ourselves. We, we sort of wanted to kind of uh, s specify the end state and then have sort of self organizing people who would achieve that as quickly as possible. Um, and again, w once I think you're doing something hard um, and, and sort of important, um, it, it, it's actually pretty, pretty easy to to recruit founders and that by and large their sort of uh, their goal function is something like uh, you know work on hard problems uh, be in a role where I can sort of define the future like cone of the company um, uh, with the best people but it's, uh, for most founders at least that, that I know the the founding bit is not actually critical it's kind of it's a proxy for those other characteristics the other cultural ownership characteristics right right um, the other thing you mentioned that a lot of founders don't do but you're sort of unique at is is you will recruit people that aren't that interested in Stripe initially. Um, many founders and many companies exclude people that initially don't show enthusiasm and passion. How do you think about that? So um, I guess there's a few ways. Um, one is that in some way, I, I, I think it's... Uh, I think it's almost kind of anti-technology to uh, to insist that they're excited about you uh, in the beginning. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's this kind of uh, great observation from Alan Kay that uh, uh, if you're building something that's truly fundamental technology, kind of almost by definition, you can't really know all of its kind of uh, end consequences, right? In that if you're working on the transistor, you cannot predict Facebook, right? You just know that there's kind of something interesting and important here. Um, and so I think that uh, y y you need people who are sort of locally interested in sort of the short-term direction, because if they're not interested in that, then I mean, they're not going to be able to make breakthroughs, right? And you need people who are excited to work with, with the other people. I think that's you know, the, the most salient part. But I think that uh, if you're working on something that's kind of, again, you know, fundamental technology in some way, you actually can't know that much about the end stage. I think you always need to describe to them how that's part of what's exciting about it, right? Um, and so there's this some element of that. I, I think also in a world where there are sort of, uh, where there are so many interesting uh, uh, kind of technological vectors, I, th I think it's a little bit arrogant to assume that sort of yours is immediately and obviously going to seem the most promising. Instead, I think you kind of need to come to understand uh, you know, what these people really want. I think normally it's to sort of build a great and enduring culture in as much as it is uh, to sort of achieve a particular end state. Um, and so I, 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 th I think there's, um, I think how to, how to characterize it, but I, I, I think there's a certain vanity on the part of founders uh, in, in sort of presupposing that all the folks they hire should have this immediate attachment to an end stage that you've spent you know, years thinking about and sort of had years to sort of get yourself excited about and, and assuming that that will sort of immediately uh, come to be understood by the folks that you want to hire. Uh, and then lastly, I think pe people underestimate sort of how once you kind of submerge yourself in a problem, it, it, it becomes more interesting, right? In that I, I, I know from conversations with you that you sort of weren't immediately enamored with venture capital, right? <laughs> and now I think after having spent you know, uh, so many months in it, you now get the depth of it and, and sort of the intellectual... It's also uh, mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of the, the, the intellectual attraction. But you know, when, when, when you hear B, B of EC sort of on day one, you don't immediately get the full resonance. No, that's true. And I wasn't interested in payments even when I joined PayPal. I had, had no idea that I would spend a lot of time doing payments. Right. Um, you also, I think, blogged about a while ago... Um, the distribution of equity among the first 10 employees. Uh, we'll talk about that. Yep. Um, so this is actually in part advice that I got from Sam Altman. Um, so uh, I, I think for him it was maybe just an offhand comment that for some reason stuck with me. Uh, he said that, uh, uh, I guess given, given the audience, I'll have to maybe modify it a little bit, but something like, um, uh, be extremely generous uh, with your employees and be less generous with your investors. And he, I think he used a more aggressive term than less generous, but we are at the Coastal Summit. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, th I think it's one of those things where when you think about it, it, it it's almost self-evident, right? In that uh, if you are fortunate enough to sort of succeed in some major way, just kind of picture yourself there on IPO day or acquisition day or wh whatever the case might be. And, you know, you're, you're definitely not going to regret sort of a marginal couple of additional percentage points that you've given those early employees and the people who kind of built the company with you. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's, it's not really so much a uh, kind of uh, necessarily sort of a financially motivated decision so much as uh, 
something kind of more personal, right? And that you, just, you really want those people to do uh, uh, exceptionally well. I think there are kind of some benefits to it for, uh, you know, they, they themselves will sort of identify more as being founders of the company as it's not quite sort of a binary state, it's more sort of a continuum. Um, and so we, um, for our first 10 people at Stripe, we, we gave away more than 10% more than of the equity, um, which, uh, you know, th there's kind of sparse data on this, but I think it is, is atypically high. Um, and, and all through the company, we've, we've generally tried to be, and actually now we're sort of putting you know, proper comp frameworks in place and things like that. Um, we've, uh, we, we've tried to generally be not exactly sort of stingy, but, but uh, noticeably sort of less aggressive than other companies on salary. We sort of aim for no more than 50% of kind of median for the role. We're just not going to compete there. We don't want the people who, uh, for whom this would be kind of the, 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 uh, the, the deciding factor. Um, uh, and, and to really uh, consistently uh, o o over index on equity. Uh, we, we got a, a comp consultant to, um, uh, uh, t to sort of analyze our cap table at some point, uh, and, and her observation, her primary observation was like, "Good God, you've given away so much equity to the employees, right?" Um, uh, and so, you know, that that's true. And then on the other hand, uh, I think our uh, again, the, the data here is sparse, but it's our sense that our retention um, uh, of those people who've now been with us for like four plus years um, is 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 much higher than normal. Right. So uh, a couple times you alluded to the culture and the importance of culture in recruiting. Um, I've observed that you have a pretty unique culture. How would you describe it? Um, I, I, I think these things are, you know, it, it, it's always in, in some way so uh, kind of uh, ineffable and hard to put your finger on that uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can be really sort of trusted to characterize it. Um, you know, there's kind of obvious uh, uh, sort of phenotypic things that we do that are different to other companies, uh, like w one of the ones we've kind of talked publicly about is this idea of email transparency, um, where basically all, kind of essentially all internal communication is public throughout the company, uh, so that if you're you know, interested in what the legal team is working on or the partnerships team or who knows, you, you, you can go and you can sort of get that context. And the thinking behind it is that, uh, uh, you know, we want people to sort of make uh, the best local decisions and ideally without us having to sort of, uh, you know, manage the overhead of sort of tr tr trying to get them to understand the overall framework, things would be much more efficient if they can just sort of pull as needed and sort of when they're making a decision on, I don't know, which bank they're going to integrate, they can go and look at the sales pipelines in different countries or w whatever the case might be. Um, and I think it's actually been you know, qu quite effective there. And so this is, I guess, transparency motivated by desire for kind of federated understanding, right? Um, I think there's also a way in which, you know, in general, one of the things we've sort of uh, really pushed in the engineering culture is uh, sort of, you know, the, the traditional view of, of engineers in the valley is very much uh, sort of engineers as implementers, right? You have the the product requirements document, you have the product manager, you have the market research, uh, you, you have all the things, right? And then the, the engineer sort of types out the Javas. Um, and uh, uh, we sort of tried to take a, a, a much broader view of what an, an engineering role should be, right? And actually, we, we only literally on Friday hired our first product manager at 250 people. And we basically said that the engineer should be doing everything end to end. They should be talking to the customers. They should be designing the product. They should be building V1 of this. They should be showing that to the customers, going to the office, getting the feedback, and sort of the complete feedback loop right through to writing the blog post uh, at the end. And so this was kind of motivated by just taking a, a, a the, 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 the there's a tendency for companies, I think, to, to take this kind of simplifying abstraction of people are a particular thing in a particular function, uh, and, and sort of that's that's a, a simpler kind of uh, atom with which you can assemble the corporate molecule. Um, but of course, people are people, and, and not just kind of their specific functions. So we sort of tried to allow for that a little bit more. And so part of the motivation behind the email transparency is, even if I'm an engineer, I might be super curious about what the legal team is doing. Just like, how does a legal team even work, right? Um, or, or what does the PR team do, or whatever the case might be, right? And so it's, it, it's partially a desire to, um, to uh, kind of sate people's curiosity um, and, and, and indeed support it. Uh, and I guess the other thing I mentioned on the culture is we've always tried to be, uh, you know, these things are all going to be so, so sui generis and kind of particular to the characteristics of the early people that I'm not sure there's kind of that much generally you can say. But, but one thing I think that is generally useful is uh, to, to just be pretty deliberate about it. And it's kind of easy to be deliberate about it in the early days because there's only 10 people who can kind of talk about what you want and you know, you're all sitting around over dinner anyway. I think it's a little bit harder to, to, to be deliberate and to kind of to, to have it be something malleable uh, as you get larger and it's something, certainly something we've grappled with 
grappled with. Um, and so I think one, it's useful to just sort of get into a habit of talking about it uh, pretty early so that people can make observations about it, what's working well, what isn't, and so forth, that it's sort of seen as kind of a, a, a product of the company like your actual products, right? And, and then to sort of think about what are the ways in which uh, you're going to how are you going to sort of modify the culture over time? Just what are kind of your habits and patterns for doing that? And so, for example, something we've just started doing is um, this thing, uh, it's kind of a, a terrible name, um, but, but uh, org hack, uh, where basically we'll assemble every couple months uh, a list of the uh, kind of uh, sourced from the employees, just like the top organizational problems within the company. Um, and then we'll sort of have uh, subgroups of them sort of go away and think about you know, ways to improve it or remedy it or whatever. Uh, they'll come up with kind of uh, you know, recommendations. We'll go trial those. We'll see if they work out or not or whatever, right? And you know, uh, I, th I think that's maybe a, a you know, a, a useful thing for us to do at our size, but sort of whatever the particular implementation might be, I think having a deliberate answer, sort of when somebody asks you, how do you modify the culture of your company, knowing what that is, I think is actually kind of pretty important. So that's also a tangible example. You have a very unique onboarding process. Can you talk about that a bit? Um, yeah, so, uh, well, we're actually going through the process of, uh, of modifying it right now, so uh, it, it might be very different in a couple of months, but um, the, the, the main thing that we sort of really tried to do uh, in the beginning is to uh, um, sort of not do what seemed to happen at Twitter. Um, and in particular, what I mean is uh, we had a bunch of people join uh, Stripe from Twitter and just kind of described problems where there was a huge amount of uh, siloing between the teams, right? Uh, I remember one guy saying to me that uh, uh, he no one had ever left his team for another team in the company. Uh, the, the state was always either join the team or leave the team, right? And, and so sorry, I, sh I should clarify. Like when I say don't be like Twitter, I mean kind of specifically in this regard. And so we we're kind of terrified by, uh, I would love to have Twitter's market cap. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. We've sort of, we're terrified by this, and that sort of as as we divided up into teams, um, uh, that sort of that, that that didn't lose kind of the the, the collective and whole of the culture, um, and so we uh, what we started out by doing is that every engineer who joined um, would go and uh, ship something on every other engineering team before they went and joined the uh, you know the team to which they were sort of. Uh, uh, going to be on long term. And then in general, we sort of tried to encourage it as much as we could uh, s s switching between teams, right? And that even if it wasn't kind of globally optimal for the company because the person had a ton of state, you know, in this area and not in that area, whatever the case might be, we thought there was kind of long term culturally good for there to be a lot of sort of uh, cross pollination in this way. And so now we're sort of at the scale where it's, there's enough engineering teams, and they have enough context that that's kind of getting uh, f fairly difficult to do. And so I think we'll probably end up with something more like a Facebook's boot camp, um, where uh, there's this kind of still a designated period where you're not on your uh, uh, sort of, again, long-term uh, assigned teams that you, you, you sort of gain broader context uh, uh, across the company, um, though we haven't implemented that just yet. The other thing I'll just kind of briefly flag is that I think it's actually, we didn't really notice this at, at the time, but it's become clear in hindsight. I think it's really valuable for there to be a time delay be, be, be between sort of uh, when somebody starts and when uh, they join somebody's team, because it helps correct, I think, one of those pernicious forces in hiring where uh, there's kind of a, a principal agent problem between the team and the company. The team wants uh, sort of, the team is overburdened, they have too much shit to get done, they sort of really need more people, right? And so kind of their incentive is to, uh, to, to hire more people, even if potentially they're sort of below the kind of the global average of the company. Um, uh, and then, of course, from the company standpoint, you, you don't care any more than sort of, uh, you know, on a relative basis about the, 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 you know, what's going on on sort of a particular team. Uh, and so I think having the time delay there means that it, it's much harder to kind of quickly hire people to solve a short-term problem, right? You're, you're, you're not going to be able to sort of quell the, the hair on fire issue today by hiring more people. And so by imposing, you know, it, we accidentally, I guess, imposed a, you know, one to two month delay. I think now actually that that perhaps should be even longer, that it's like three months between sort of the, the, you know, the requisition request and when you actually get someone. Wow. All right. So Stripe also deferred hiring external managers for a very long time. I mean, probably 150, 200 employees when you sort of added your first external yep. hire. Um, what was the signal to you that you needed to start changing uh, the management layer? Um, so we weren't one of those companies that... Uh, uh, 
believes that we shouldn't have managers or never would or anything like that, right? I remember one of our engineers edited our jobs page at some point to say Stripe doesn't have any managers, and um, uh, we like that day we went and reverted it because kind of. One, it sort of wasn't true in that arguably I was already a manager, and, and two, it just kind of se seemed naive, and you know, we certainly were going to end up at that point. We didn't want to attract people who you know, were coming for that reason. Um, but I think, it was, um, I think it was largely a consequence of hiring founders and sort of people who already knew what they were doing and, uh, to, again, could sort of hit the ground running, uh, in that I think that if you successfully mo primarily hire those people, they just don't need a lot of management, right? I, I, I think sort of amount of management people require is, uh, is almost an inverse proportion uh, to their level of experience, right? Uh, and so uh, there just there wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, I think if you hire a lot of new college grads or sort of people new to the domain or things like this, then just in practice there, there, there is a, a, a whole lot more. And so, I mean, we eventually hit the point where uh, sort of it, it was necessary, but I think we were able to d defer it for, for you know, a very helpfully long time, right? In that it, it meant that we sort of didn't need to you know, deal with a bunch of management overhead in the early days. It also meant that we were able to preserve the kind of people who would make great managers as individual contributors for a long time, right? In that there's this guy who manages our, uh, our ML and data teams, and he's, he's, he's now a, you know, a great manager, but because we didn't need Need managers for so long. He was actually able to be like an independent contributor on these teams for like several years, and that's basically like having you know the Le LeBron James of data infrastructure <laughs> just like building it for you, right? It was it was really great. And uh, so once you decided you wanted to add some management, um, how'd you go about the process of identifying who you want, recruiting them, you know, uh, assessing them? Yep. So, so I guess there's kind of two sides to this. There's like the management team, and then there's kind of management, middle management throughout the company. Um, the the middle management slash I guess non-management team. Um, uh, it, it still kind of makes me sad because um, I'm very happy with the people we've ended up in these roles. But by and large, we uh, we promoted from within, um, which I guess is sort of what people you know, say is, is the better one to do. Um, what, what they don't tell you as much, or at least I, I never heard, was that uh, that basically means you're sort of snipping out your most productive people throughout the organization, right? And so effectively, we went and uh, fired our like 10 most productive engineers, and we fired them into management. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit rueful about it, uh, but that's essentially how we went about it. One kind of nice side effect of uh, sort of how long we went is there was a tremendous kind of um, uh, d degree of kind of uh, uh, moral support for the move in that m maybe if we'd done it at the sort of the you know, normally right time, I don't know, maybe it was 60 people or something, uh, that uh, uh, people would have questioned whether or not we actually needed it. Because we postponed, postponed it for so long, people were like quite enthusiastic <laughs> about it. Um, uh, and, and then just briefly on the management team, um, the, the one thing I'd sort of quickly flag is, in my experience, uh, entrepreneurs don't start thinking about it sort of nearly early enough. I certainly did not start thinking about it nearly early enough. And uh, like I remember somebody asking me when there were 50 people or so, like, what's your management team like? And I mean, one, it didn't exist. Um, and two, I hadn't even kind of particularly thought about the question before. Um, whereas in fact, uh, you know, I mean, the management team is kind of the uh, the entity through which you exercise most of your daily influence over the company, right? And so I think uh, sort of deficiencies in that or uh, any kind of anything short of, of sort of uh, of optimality is actually a huge cost to the company. Uh, and I think that sort of in practice, I mean, you know, you you can sort of. Um, Take, take kind of functional cuts on how founders or executives should be spending their time, like on recruiting or on product or whatever. But I think there's also just kind of a, a general kind of maybe a horizontal cut of uh, of looking at this through the lens of the management team, right? And I think you know it, it does not sound at all crazy for me to me for, for a founder to be spending a third of their time on just building that, and that might involve recruiting or training or one-on-ones or whatever, right? But but just kind of getting that into the right state. So about I don't know six nine months ago, you added a very senior business operations hire. How how did you think about that process? Um, so th this came from ar ar around that time when I sort of started realizing kind of the, the, the oh shit moment on the management team. Um, and, uh, and so spent about a year uh, just uh, uh, meeting as many people as possible who seemed like not even necessarily with particular roles in mind, but just kind of I didn't feel like I had a particularly well calibrated sense for what sort of a really high performing business leader uh, w was like. And then I felt that maybe after meeting kind of a couple dozen people, I could sort of start to see maybe the, the deficiencies in our own team. Um, and 
uh, as it happened, sort of after maybe, again, a year of this process, it both became clear that we had sort of a major deficiency in this area. Uh, we, we just kind of hadn't hired senior leadership in terms of sales account management support, sort of user operations and, and, and things like this. Um, and, and that secondly, the, the person who kind of leaving our particular kind of exigencies and needs aside, the person who I just thought was most impressive was this woman, uh, uh, Claire Johnson. Uh, and so it, it kind of, uh, it, it matched up pretty nicely there. But w we were pretty terrified about, um, I talked to some people at Facebook and uh, it sounds like when they sort of hired Cheryl, that even though Cheryl has been sort of such a spectacular success for them, that it was like a pretty rocky kind of early months, as, uh, first couple of months as kind of the adjustment happened on both sides. Um, and so uh, we probably spent, I probably spent maybe like 50 hours with Claire before we sort of decided that, you know, this was sort of the right thing for the company. And you know, luckily it has been. Awesome. Well, we're basically out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, cool. Can you talk about recruiting and team building from 50 to 250? You spoke a lot about 0 to 10. Yes. Um, so, um, so the big thing that we spent a lot of time on, be, kind of post 10, between 10 and 50, was uh, uh, building a good uh, engineering brand. Um, and I think that a lot of not a lot of companies take this kind of ex seriously as sort of an explicit kind of uh, a goal item. Um, and there were a couple of things that influenced us. One was um, there was a very small company out of Boston called Casebleis. Uh, they'd built sort of uh, uh, live patching technology for the Linux kernel, and we'd hired a couple of people from it. Um, and they had they hadn't raised any VC, and they were in Boston, and they sort of they, they had a couple of other sort of disadvantages. And so they decided that they. Um, uh, I, w I went to school in Boston, so I, I can criticize it. But um, <laughs> uh, they, uh, b because anyway, they were sort of you know, weird and different in a few ways, they decided that they sort of needed to compensate for that by taking uh, building a brand sort of really seriously. And they published all these like really great uh, uh, engineering blog posts um, about, I mean, things that were only tangentially related to what they did, but had the very powerful effect of just showing how smart and competent they were. And kind of to the point of, that being the kind of high order bit in who you want to work with was actually extremely effective. And you can sort of do all this stuff about convince people why live Linux kernel updating technology is cool kind of later, uh, but, but they, they just made sort of really powerfully clear um, just how, uh, how high the kind of degree of talent was. Um, and so we sort of figured that, uh, you know, if um, this is a passage in, in Creativity Inc. about uh, the, uh, Ed Catmull's book about uh, sort of you know in, in the duality between sort of people and ideas, which is actually more important. Um, and he sort of uh, you know generally people sort of say, well you know it's kind of a mix of the two, but he kind of powerfully comes down on the side of no, it is just the people that is the answer. Um, and uh, sort of if you if you take that as being true, then uh, I think kind of your I mean recruiting in general and, and your recruiting brand in particular sort of more obviously become sort of a, 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 a top level kind of goal for the company. And, and so we decided to invest quite a lot of time and effort in, in building this. No one had ever heard of us before, um, and so we, we just kind of took it as a goal item. And so we, we did things like we did capture the flag, security contests. They took, you know, each, we, we've done three so far, and it probably took a, each one probably took like a, a man year of engineering time. And so these were like pretty significant investments. We wrote random blog posts about just like, cool engineering things. Uh, if you go back to our, I mean, now our blog is kind of about you know, product improvements or something. If you go back to the early days of our blog, there's a lot of sort of random stuff about just th things we thought were cool, but sort of attracted attention in sort of the, the, these particular areas. Um, and uh, anyway, so, so, so that was the real, really the goal. We, we knew that we couldn't sort of invest like the same degree of, of kind of care and time in you know, employees 100 through 110 as we did in, in zero through 10. Uh, but we tried to ensure that we sort of had the the reputation in general um, that you know s such that we could perhaps compensate at least a little bit um, for you know in what we um, were forgoing in terms of assessment ability in terms of uh, increasing the quality of, of, of the applicant pool. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think if, and obviously it doesn't just apply to engineering cultures, but if you think that you have sort of a, an outsized capability on, on some access or in some area or whatever, I think it's really to your advantage to sort of, to pretty aggressively kind of make that kind of broadly known and, and, and public in that, you know, as an engineering culture, we just kind of knew that 
the vast majority of companies just like could not match us in the things they were doing. They, they can sort of turn around and start writing sort of equivalently good engineering posts or you know, running equivalently good security CTFs. They just like literally did not have the engineers for it. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I think sort of in whatever your kind of competitive domain is, doing something like that is, is, is probably likely to be pretty effective. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.